He beat her up mercilessly that night. She was in pain, but it was part of the plan. She took pictures of herself after he beat her. The next night, we were stationed at my office with my husband and his colleagues, waiting for Sam, whom we were sure would try to break in. The gates were open, but the door to my office wasn't. He broke it and went in, going straight to where the keys and documents truly were. As he grabbed them, we all came out. He tried to run, but my husband teased him, and he fell on the floor. Then my husband arrested him immediately, and he was taken away. Hi, my name is Anna. My younger brother, Sam, was born four years after I was born. Right from when he started walking, it was already obvious how stubborn he was. He would touch things he was warned not to touch. He caused trouble by breaking plates around and pushing the pieces under the table. One day my dad had gone into the kitchen to grab a glass of water, but he got pierced by one of the pieces of broken plate. However, rather than discipline him, our dad spoiled him. When he was told he broke the plate, he went silent and didn't apologize. That aside, our home wasn't filled with love. Just my mom seemed to bring all the love in. Even though my dad favored my little brother in some way, he didn't care much about me. He had a great job that I learned fetched him quite enough money, but he barely gave us allowances. While my mom was away, he would often bring strange ladies to the house and make us promise to never tell our mom about it. It was hard keeping a secret from her, but we had no choice to. Our dad had threatened to send us out of his house if we ever told her. And when I was around 12 years of age, I heard him quarreling with my mom. Apparently, Sam had told my mom about our dad's behaviors whenever she wasn't home, and that made my mom pissed. From what I got out of their argument, my mom wasn't surprised about it. Instead, she was disappointed that he was doing it in front of his young children. That fight led to him leaving the house that night. You're being bold with me, right? Let me see how you manage with the kids and yourself while I'm away. No matter how much we begged him, his decision was already finalized. He left the house and took with him his money, cars, and a few other things. Our mom was left stranded. Her job as a teacher could barely even feed her. It was a tough period for us, trying to adjust to the life our dad had subjected us to. A few weeks later, Sam and I overheard our mom crying on the phone. It's not even been two months and he's already with another woman. He also bought a new car. Meanwhile, his children and I are suffering. Anna, I think the person managed to calm her after a few minutes as she stopped crying. Dad's quite lucky with women. How could he get someone else in less than a month? I was truly surprised hearing his comment. Was that all he cared about? I stormed to my room in anger, ignoring his voice as he continuously yelled out my name. Luckily, our mom got a better job at a huge company, and things began to change for us. With just us and our brother, I began to wonder how best we could train Sam so he doesn't end up like our father. I told my mom about it, but she shrugged it off, saying nothing of that sort would happen. By the time we were both getting closer to adulthood, our mom had tried to start a delivery business that had become very popular. Meanwhile, Sam was growing worse each day. He would bring in different young girls every day while our mom was away. I'd tried my best to teach him like a father would, even though I'm a woman. However, it seemed as though I didn't try enough. He got worse each passing day. Different ladies would visit our home, complaining about Sam cheating on them with their friends, sisters, or strangers. Most times, the girls ended up fighting with each other, often leading to injuries. It was quite a tough period while he was growing up. Worst of all, he was extremely strong-headed and would never listen to a word I said. My mom developed high blood pressure from always having to worry about him. She also wanted him to stop, but there wasn't anything much she could do. Around the time he was age 28, he suddenly brought home a lady, Kate, and said he wanted to get married to her. She looked so beautiful, kind, and respectful. It made me scared for her. She appeared like a loyal lady, but I knew Sam wasn't loyal in any way. I excused myself and asked Sam to follow me. He reluctantly did. If you're going to put her through pains from your promiscuous attitude, don't get married to her. And how's that any business of yours? I didn't bring her here for your stupid advice, okay? I knew that would be his reaction. I knew I couldn't tell her about his attitude as that would make him vexed. But thinking back now, I think I should have warned her. They got married a year after I did. Barely two months into their marriage, Kate came crying to me, her face all bruised and swollen. Sam had beat her up after she demanded to know the reason he was always out until late into the night. According to her, 
His job didn't require him to stay out later than 5 p.m., but he was always home after midnight. Sometimes I see lipstick stains on his shirt. Also, I perceive female cologne on him. I'm tired. It was sad to see her crying so much over Sam's silly attitude. I gave her false hopes by convincing her that my brother would never cheat on her. And there might be a lady trying hard to turn his eyes to her. If not, Sam isn't like that. I shouldn't have lied to her, but I also couldn't reveal my brother's true self to her. I promised her that I was going to speak to him and convinced her that he'll change. Afterward, I took her to a hospital and had the doctor treat her wounds. I called my brother that night to talk to him about what Kate had told me, but he flared up. I've told you countless times to get your eyes out of my marriage. I'm going to deal with you seriously if you don't, regardless of the bloodline we share. He hung up afterward. I was fed up. I knew Sam would never listen, but I didn't want him to continue hurting the poor lady who did nothing but love him. The next day, Kate showed up at my place, all bruised and in even worse pain than the previous day. Sam had hit her for coming to report his behavior to me. Kate was convinced that he was cheating on her. She told me she was going to find the woman who was making her husband mistreat her. But I knew within myself that it wasn't just a woman. Sam probably had over three women he was cheating on Kate with. I knew she would get even more hurt if she realizes that it wasn't just one woman, and he's been an irresponsible man since way back. My husband was a cop. While Kate was crying in my living room, he walked in. I was surprised to see him, as I'd thought he wouldn't be home until the next day. Who's this? He asked. I explained who Kate was and what was going on, still excluding the part of my brother's true character. My husband told her it was a crime to hit her to that extent, and encouraged her to report him to the police. I was scared of what would happen if they did that. It could worsen his bad attitude toward Kate. I tried to stop them, but my husband was against it. If he's punished for his actions, he'd forget about that woman he's cheating with and learn how to love his wife properly. I wanted to tell them it wasn't just one woman, but I couldn't. Anyway, that night, my husband with two of his men, Kate and I went over to his house. There, he was arrested for beating up his wife so badly. My brother spent two weeks in a cell before he was released. Did he get better? No, he got worse. He went on with his promiscuity and never stopped beating her. Eventually, I was forced to reveal my brother's true attitude to Kate and my husband. They were both pissed. How could you keep such a thing away from her? She's his wife and deserves to know. You could have told her from the beginning. Kate, on the other hand, just sat on the floor, crying. I begged her to forgive me for holding it all in. The next day, we visited my mom and made a plan to take him to a therapist. My mom promised to call him and talk to him about it. Right when we were talking about it, my mom's phone rang. It was my dad's old lawyer. She wondered why he was calling. When she answered it, she was informed that my dad had died two weeks ago and it was time to read out his will. I was surprised to hear that he'd requested Sam's and my presence while it's being read. With the case of the therapy pushed aside for a while, we headed to my father's house three days later. In his will, two mansions were given to me, two to my mom and one to Sam. That made him furious. But what the lawyer told my mom and I that my father had found out, Sam was spoiled and bitter towards women and didn't leave him much as a punishment. He loved me the most. How can he give you both more? We ignored his ranting and left home, but from then on, he became like an insane man. Every day, he would come to my house yelling at the top of his voice that I should give the second mansion to him as he deserved it. I refused. He gave them to me, not you. Leave me alone, Sam. He refused and continued harassing my mother and I for the mansions and even punched me. I reported him to my husband and we decided that it was fine to put Sam in his place. We knew how desperate he was for the mansions and set up a trap for him. Our plan pulled through one week later. Kate intentionally left their bedroom when I called her, making it seem like she was hiding something. Of course, Sam followed her. You put the keys and documents to you and your mother's mansions in your office? What if it gets stolen? The call was on loudspeaker, so he heard the reason I kept it there. I also intentionally revealed the exact place they were kept. After I hung up, my husband called Kate. This time it wasn't on loudspeaker. They spoke as though they were flirting, but also in a joking way. I took the phone afterward and said, I love you to Kate. 
She replied back with the same words before ending the call. That got Sam jealous and angry, thinking she was cheating on him. He beat her up mercilessly that night. She was in pain, but it was part of the plan. She took pictures of herself after he beat her. The next night, we were stationed at my office with my husband and his colleagues, waiting for Sam, whom we were sure would try to break in. The gates were open, but the door to my office wasn't. He broke it and went in, going straight to where the keys and documents truly were. As he grabbed them, we all came out. He tried to run, but my husband teased him, and he fell on the floor. Then my husband arrested him immediately, and he was taken away. He was charged to court for abusing his wife, breaking into my office, and stealing important properties. All those left him with a five-year jail term. My mom felt bad, but he needed to be taught a lesson. Kate got a divorce from him while he was still in jail. She remarried to a better man in my brother's third year of serving. Of course, she maintained a close relationship with my family. She also got custody of his mansion and half of the little money he had in his bank as settlement and compensation for his mistreatment. It's been four years already, and I've birthed my first son. Kate was pregnant with her first child with her new husband. My mom has relocated to another country to spend her remaining years. Sam is left alone in jail without visits from anyone. He sent countless apology letters, but we never replied to any. He would come out to another hard time being homeless, jobless, and without money. Serves him right, doesn't it? Oh, would you look at that? The black man is threatening me with violence. What a surprise. Is that all you filthy people know what to do? I knew you were a racist jerk, but none of that matters now. You need to leave. No, I don't. She's my wife and I can do as I please. I don't take orders from some inhuman trash like you. Even though it was a bad idea, I stepped around the hospital bed and stood in front of Scott and tried to intimidate him to leave. The second I was in front of him, he swung at me and punched me in the jaw. It hurt, but I had so much adrenaline pumping through my veins that I shrugged it off and then punched him back as hard as I could in the stomach. He folded over and when he did, I grabbed a nearby crutch that had been left in the room and I swung it down hard on his back. Hi there, my name is Emmett and my family is simply amazing. Let me start by saying that I was adopted. You see, my parents were having issues having a child, but they wanted a family so badly that they looked and found a child that really needed a good home. My birth parents died when I was very young. To be honest, I'm not sure what happened to them, but Joy and Thomas lovingly took me into their home and cared for me like I was their own flesh and blood. It truly didn't matter that I was black and they were white. To them, we were just family. And then a few years later, a miracle happened and Joy became pregnant and nine months later gave birth to my sister, Taylor. Even though she was their own flesh and blood, they treated me no different than they treated her. And the two of us grew up in a very loving and wonderful family. So when Taylor came and told me that she had started dating someone and that he might just end up being the one she marries, I was super excited for her. And I just assumed that our amazing family was going to get even bigger. After a couple months of her mentioning him, she decided that it was time to introduce him to me. The day I met Scott did not end up going very well. Scott, this is my brother Emmett. And Emmett, this is the love of my life, Scott. Huh, is this your brother? Yeah, why? Well, um, he's black. Yeah, I was adopted by our parents before they had Taylor. So Scott, what do you do for a living? Right, okay, um, I work in business. Oh, really? Same here. I work for Mega Investors Group. You work for them, but they're one of the biggest companies around. I wouldn't have guessed that someone like you could work there. Someone like me? Never mind. Let's just go eat. There was something about the way that he was speaking to me and the way that he looked at me. I could tell that he was uncomfortable, but Taylor seemed very happy with him, so I just brushed it off as nervousness. A few months after I was introduced to him, the two of them got engaged and set a wedding date for later in the year. As the day approached, I went over to my sister's house to see if she needed help with anything. Hey sis, I just thought I would come over and see if everything was ready for the big day. Yes, we are all set. Actually, I'm glad that you are here. Scott, maybe you could ask my brother if he can join you on your bachelor party? Mmm, yeah. 
okay, maybe. I could see that he really didn't want me to go. And when my sister left the room so that we could talk in private, I told him that it was okay if he didn't feel comfortable with me going. It's okay if you don't want me to go, by the way. I won't be offended. Oh, that's a relief. It's not that we are going to do anything crazy. I just don't think you will get along with my friends very well. They don't really like your kind. My kind? Yeah, you're black. And they don't like black people very much. Listen, I promise that we'll behave. But could you tell Taylor that you couldn't go because you're sick or something? She already doesn't like most of my friends, and I really don't want to have a fight about them again. Yeah. Um, sure, I guess so. The way that he just announced that his friends were horrible racists didn't sit well with me, although it did explain the way he reacted around me now. It was clear that he was more than likely just as racist as his buddies and that my sister didn't see it. At any rate, I wanted her to be happy so much that I did as Scott asked. And on the night of the bachelor party, I told my sister that I was sorry, but I had to stay home because of a cold. Scott pretended to be disappointed, which irritated me. It felt wrong lying to my sister, but at the time, I just felt like it was the best way to avoid an uncomfortable situation. The day of the wedding came and passed, and it was a wonderful affair, except all the groomsmen that kept staring me down. Thankfully, none of them said or did anything on the day of the wedding, but I could tell that they hated me. Months passed, and on a very lovely summer day, I asked my sister to go for a walk with me. When she arrived at the park where we usually walked, she had a black eye. Whoa, sis, what happened to you? Huh? Oh. Oh, you mean this black eye? Yeah. What happened? Oh, I was carrying some laundry up the stairs from the basement and I tripped and fell down them. Just then I noticed a bruise on her wrist as well. The bruise went all the way around her arm, and if I didn't know better, I would have assumed that it looked like Scott had grabbed her wrist and squeezed it really hard. You got both those bruises from falling down the stairs? Um, yeah. How else could I have gotten them? I let it go at the moment, but I made a mental note to check in on her more often. She could of course be telling me the truth, but I already didn't trust Scott, and the people that he associated with were not good influences on him. After that day, I tried to get Taylor to go for more walks with me, and sometimes she agreed, but there were week-long stretches where she refused to go. The long stretches were making me feel nervous and worried for her. Then one day she announced that she was pregnant. My parents and I were so excited. A new addition to our family was such a wonderful blessing. We bought my sister and Scott, strollers, a crib, and tons of clothes and baby toys. Although we knew that we went a little overboard with the gifts, we couldn't help it. The first few months were fairly easy on Taylor, although she still had long stretches when she was unavailable to see me. And then one day, I got a call from Taylor and she said that she was in the hospital. Terrified, I rushed over to the hospital and saw that she was lying in a bed with a black eye, a split lip, and a cast on one arm. She looked like she had been in a car accident. Oh my God, Taylor, what happened to you? Emmett, I'm so glad that you're here. She burst into tears as soon as she saw me and I rushed over and hugged her gently. What happened, Taylor? Did Scott do this to you? Yes. He came home from work furious because he didn't get the promotion that he wanted and he took it out on me. He was drunk and he started hitting me and kicking me and calling me a slut and that he hated the baby. Oh, Taylor, I'm so sorry. This isn't the first time, but this was the scariest. He went way too far this time. He caused me to have a miscarriage. My blood went ice cold. Not only was this monster hurting my sister, but he had killed my future nephew or niece as well. I wanted to choke the life out of him. Just then, he walked into the room and smiled weakly at Taylor. Hey babe, I brought you some flowers. I heard that you fell down the stairs again. You really need to be more careful. Stop it. I told Emmett what really happened. You shouldn't be here. I never want to see you again. Stop talking, stupid babe. You need me. No, you moron. She doesn't. And you need to leave before I make you leave. Oh, would you look at that? The black man is threatening me with violence. What a surprise. Is that all you filthy people know what to do? I knew you were a racist jerk, but none of that matters now. You need to leave. No, I don't. She's my wife and I can do as I please. I don't take orders from some inhuman trash like you. Even though it was a bad idea, I stepped around the hospital bed and stood in front of Scott and tried to intimidate him to leave. 
The second I was in front of him, he swung at me and punched me in the jaw. It hurt, but I had so much adrenaline pumping through my veins that I shrugged it off and then punched him back as hard as I could in the stomach. He folded over, and when he did, I grabbed a nearby crutch that had been left in the room and I swung it down hard on his back. Then when he was on the floor, I swung it at him a few more times before I realized he was unconscious. My sister and I then called security and the police and told them what had happened. Both the security and the police agreed that I had only acted in self-defense and they hauled Scott away. The next day, my sister and I pressed charges against Scott. He was forced to spend a few weeks in prison since no one could afford to bail him out. And on the day of the trial, he was charged with assault, spousal abuse, and even murder since his actions caused the death of the unborn baby. He was found guilty of all three and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. I personally think he should have gotten more time than that, but I can rest easily, knowing that his time in prison will be extra hard on him. As it turns out, when I hit him with that crutch, I caused permanent damage to his spine, and Scott will have to walk with a limp for the rest of his life. In fact, he has to use a walker, or else he has no balance at all. Even Scott's family never visits him in jail, because they are disgusted of his actions. As for my sister, she went through years of therapy, but I'm happy to say that she is doing much better now. Getting a divorce from Scott definitely helped, and since he was in jail, the judge that oversaw her case granted her their house and all their assets. She would have gotten monthly alimony payments as well, but Scott was in prison and wouldn't be making any money. Eventually, she had healed enough that she decided to put herself out there again and is even starting to date. Hopefully, she'll find someone who will treat her well. But if not, her older brother will happily protect her again. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment down below saying I subscribed and we will try our best to reply to your comment. My son wants new shoes and clothes. Give me your salary to get it for him. But mother, how can I give you my salary for David's shoes and clothes? That money is for me. I need it to survive. You don't have to survive. There are different knives in the kitchen and different oceans in the world. Stab yourself or drown in one. Mother? Stop calling me that, you unfortunate child. Your brother's going to inherit his grandfather's properties and will be rich. A girl? No, I want a boy. I don't want to give birth to a girl. Are you sure it's a girl that's in there? We're not interested in having a girl. My father wasn't wealthy, but his father was. However, before he married my mother, his father died, and in his will, he asked that none of his properties should be given to my father. The reason was because he was very irresponsible and didn't prove to be a son that could take care of the things he left behind. I'm his only child. How could he do this to me? My grandfather, in his will, had instructed that his properties be left in the care of my grandmother until my father had a son. When the son gets to 18 years of age, he'd be permitted to take over. My father was furious, but there was still hope. My mother tried to calm him down. I'll do my best to give you a son and 18 years will pass by quickly. My father was reassured by her words. My grandmother was still in her 60s, so she was very fit to handle everything. Two months after that happened, my mother was pregnant with me. You can imagine their excitement when they discovered the news. My father was even happier. However, that joy was cut short when they went for an ultrasound scan. They didn't want to believe that they'd been excited for nothing. They visited three more hospitals, but all showed the same results. You're having a girl. They hated me from that moment. When I was born, my mother even asked for the doctors to put me up for adoption, but they refused because my parents had no valid reason. They were forced to return home with me. I was only six months old when they took me to my grandmother to live with her. They began trying for another child again. One day, two years later, I was with my grandmother when she got a call from my parents. They'd finally had another child, my brother. I was excited. My small mind thought they'd finally come take me back for us to all live together, but it was far from what I imagined. The only time I ever saw my parents or my brother was when my grandma visited them with me and they always acted like I wasn't a part of the family. They both ignored me. A year later, my grandmother had to leave the country for something important, and I was taken back to my parents. Can't you take her with you, mother? We don't need her here. 
Yes, mother, take her with you. My grandmother refused. She reminded them that I was their child and they must take care of me. They were eventually forced to accept me. My grandmother assured me that she'd be back soon, but for 10 whole years, she didn't return. Even though she wasn't present, she ensured to always send my parents and I money and took care of all my needs. However, my greedy parents took all the money. They refused to send me to the school my grandmother asked them to, didn't give me enough food, barely spent time with me and only took care of my brother. Once I was 18 and out of high school, my parents forced me to get a job. I did find one at a factory. It was extremely stressful, but I had no choice. My parents also stopped giving me money and kept everything my grandmother sent to themselves. David is more important than you. We would sell you off if we could. The only reason you're still here is because my mother knows you. Your existence is nearly useless to us. My job was barely enough to feed me, but I couldn't quit. I had no phone and couldn't contact my grandmother. Two months after I got my first pay, my mother suddenly came to me. Give me some money. The cash your grandmother sent us is gone. But I have no money, mother. The only money I have is for food. You evil child. Are you hiding money from us? Would you want your brother to get skinny like you? I tried to explain to her that my salary was little, but she wasn't having it. She grabbed my bag and searched through it. You stupid liar. Didn't you say you had no money? In tears, I begged her to return the money, but she refused and stormed off. I broke down into tears, frustrated at their behavior. I couldn't go to work that day as I had no energy because of how hungry I was. The next morning, I walked out of my room to see my parents and brother, enjoying a meal at the dining table. I walked to them, my stomach growling. Can I get some food, please? I'm starving. We have no food reserved for you. Get lost. Mother said you aren't part of our family, so leave, stupid. I turned away with my head bowed and my eyes dripping with tears. I decided to go to my workplace. You're fired. Please, leave. I knew he'd say that. It was a rule that any worker who was absent without notice would be fired. However, I was starving. I swallowed my pride and went on my knees. Please give me some food, I'm hungry. The man was touched seeing my tears and ordered some food for me. He asked if I had no parents and I explained my situation to him. My grandmother is the only one who cares about me. She's not in this country anymore and doesn't know how I'm being treated by my parents. I also can't tell her because I have no phone. He couldn't believe his ears. How can a parent treat their own child so badly? After our discussion, he gave me my job back. I was more than grateful to him. The next month, once I got my salary, my mother came again. I had no idea how she knew that I'd gotten paid. My son wants new shoes and clothes. Give me your salary to get it for him. But mother, how can I give you my salary for David's shoes and clothes? That money is for me. I need it to survive. You don't have to survive. There are different knives in the kitchen and different oceans in the world. Stab yourself or drown in one. Mother? Stop calling me that, you unfortunate child. Your brother's going to inherit his grandfather's properties and will be rich. You better buy him things now so he can have some pity on you when he's rich. I cried and begged, but she refused and stood on her words that I hand all of my salary over to her. When I refused, she attempted to grab my bag, but I was faster and took it first. I won't let you bully me anymore. Since you don't regard me as your child, at least let me have peace on my own. I regretted my actions immediately. She called my brother, who was only 16, but had grown so big. She doesn't want to give us money for the shoes and clothes you requested. Teach her a lesson. I knew my brother also hated me, but there was a little hope in me that he might stand up for his sister. However, that hope was shattered when he sent a resounding slap across my face. How dare you refuse my mother's request, you stupid girl. Your money belongs to us. I'm going to teach you a lesson you'll never forget. Due to how lanky I was, I couldn't fight back. While he continued beating me, my mother took all my salary and stood at a corner, laughing. When he was finally done, I was left bruised and in severe pains. I could barely sleep that night. The next morning, my father walked into my room. He saw my condition and still slapped me. 
Don't you dare disrespect my wife again. You're a mistake to us, and you have no rights in this house. In pain, I got ready and left for work. My boss was shocked to see the condition I was in. He asked me to return home after someone helped me dress my wounds. Before I left, he gave me a phone he wasn't using anymore and told me to find a way to call my grandmother and inform her of what was happening. I thanked him and left. When I got home, I saw my father sleeping. I quietly took his phone, took my grandmother's number from it, and left the house again. Luckily, I was able to reach her. In tears, I explained everything to her. She was furious and promised to return the next day. I went back to the house, relieved to know that my sufferings would end the next day. I was in my room the next afternoon when I heard my grandmother's voice. Where's my granddaughter? I dashed out of my room. As she saw how I looked, she broke down in tears. You're all evil. I'm taking my granddaughter with me. Well, mother, we have no use of her here. You can take her. We're fine with our lovely David. Yes, take her. We don't need her in our lives. She shouldn't have been born in the first place. My grandmother was shocked hearing such words from them. She asked me to pack my things and go with her. We left the country the next day. My grandmother let me rest for a month before she began training me in the family's business. I asked her why, and she told me, You'll know soon. For two whole years, my parents never cared to ask about me. My grandmother continued sending them money. I'd become very good at the business that I was made to manage one of the branches. My father called my grandmother one day, while we were both eating at a restaurant. Mother, David is 18 now. It's time to hand over the business to him, according to father's will. I'll be back in the country next week. We'll talk about this then. The next week, we both traveled back home. Even though they tried to hide it, I could see their looks of shock to see me. The lawyer walked in a few minutes later, and we all sat down. Now, my dearest son, we didn't read your father's will completely. Can you please read the rest of the will to them? And if his son is irresponsible too, my property should be handed to his daughter. And if she's like them, let it all be given to charity after my wife's death. Just like you, you've both trained your son to be evil-minded and reckless. Ava told me how you both made him a spoilt brat. Well, I'm sorry to break your hearts, but Ava here will be in charge of all the businesses. She's well-trained and also has a hard-working and relentless spirit. She's humble and kind, unlike you both. However, there is one other matter that needs to be addressed. What are you talking about, you old crone? Nothing is more important than my son getting what he is owed. But that's just it. He isn't your son. I hired a private investigator and he managed to get a DNA sample from your son. And sure enough, he isn't related to you. So I had them look into if you had adopted him and found out that you had illegally purchased him. These fine gentlemen are here to see to it that you get what you actually deserve. Just then, several police officers entered the room and put my parents in handcuffs and dragged them away, leaving my brother behind. He was stunned to hear that the people that he had thought of as his parents his whole life had actually just been his kidnappers. After that, my parents were sentenced to several years in prison for the crime of trafficking a child. I knew that I could probably get them in even more trouble if I pressed charges against them for the years of abuse against me. But I knew that once they were released from prison, that they would be poor and unable to get jobs on account of being criminals. It was enough that I was given everything that they had ever wanted and that their hopes and dreams were taken from them. It might sound cruel of me to say, but I feel no sympathy for them at all, and as for my brother. Well, he ended up living on the streets, and the last I heard of him. He was begging for money, and had become addicted to drugs. It's such a pity, really. He could have had a chance of a good life, had he never met my parents. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment down below saying I subscribed, and we will try our best to reply to your comment. To my surprise, she went to the bathroom and came out with makeup that she used to create a black eye and other bruises. Then she called the police on me and I got arrested and put behind bars. I kept telling them that I never even touched her and that my wife was making things up. The cops laughed and told me to tell it to the judge. It's a love story that is shocking and I am glad that I am alive to tell you the story. Here goes. My name is Adam, 
and I have dedicated myself to my work as a software engineer. It's very detailed stuff where I have to work long hours to solve lots of tricky things. This didn't leave me much time for meeting people through friends or at dances. So I took to online dating. There was one woman online that interested me. Her name was Carmel and she was young and beautiful. She also said she had never dated anyone seriously before and she liked to do housework and liked children. Over the years, I met her a few times in her country and pretty soon I was hooked. I did all the paperwork and paid all the fees and one day she came over as my bride. I was so happy. I made good money, so all I expected from her was to clean the house and make me a good dinner. I didn't expect too much, and I was all so easygoing. I felt Carmel would be happy with me. But the first thing that came out of her mouth was a big surprise. Carmel, it's great to see you. How was your journey? Thank you, Adam. It was a long trip, but I'm excited to be here. There's something I need to tell you, though. Sure. What is it? I have two children a boy, Frank, and a girl, Beth. They're back in my hometown, and I want to bring them here with me. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. Why didn't you mention it earlier? I understand it's unexpected, Adam. My children are my world, and I want them to have a chance at a better life. I hope you can understand. Carmel, if we're going to build a life together, I want all of us to be a part of it. Since I am easygoing, I did all the paperwork and we eventually brought her kids over. They weren't kids. They were 15 and 16 years old. Carmel wanted all the best for them, so I agreed to pay for their private school education. For the first few weeks, Carmel agreed to cook for me, but she said that she had a medical condition that prevented her from standing too long. Most days, I came home to frozen dinners, pizzas, and lots of takeout foods. Then, she started asking me to give her money for her parents, who needed an urgent operation in her home country. It was costly, but I agreed to give her the money. When the kids finally came over, Frank and Beth immediately asked for computers to play video games. Since I wanted to be a great dad to my stepchildren, I happily forked over the money. Meanwhile, my work was busy, and it often involved me traveling out of the country. Carmel said she had everything under control. She said she would be volunteering with some community groups to learn English and help out. One day, my conference ended early, so I took an early flight home. As soon as I got home, no one was there and the kids were still in school. I decided to spend some time looking at our wedding pictures online. I happened to find a file that was strangely encrypted. It was protected by a password, but I managed to unlock it using our anniversary date. I opened it up and found hundreds of emails between Carmel and five other men. Lots of the emails were love letters and requests for money. I was so shocked that I almost fainted. As soon as she walked through the door, I wanted some answers. Carmel, we need to talk. I found letters and messages from five different men on our computer. What's going on? Adam, it's not what you think. I had to do what I could to make ends meet. Five different men, Carmel? Explain. You never gave me enough money for my hair, for the things I needed. I had to ask for help from others. Why didn't you talk to me about this if you needed more support? You were always too busy with work, and I had to figure things out on my own. This is not about money. It's about trust, Carmel. You went behind my back with other men instead of talking to me. Carmel glared at me as if I was a wolf. Then she demanded that I give her lots of money so that she could disappear with the kids. She threatened to call the police and tell them that I was a wife beater if I didn't give her the money. I told her that I never touched her at all. To my surprise, she went to the bathroom and came out with makeup that she used to create a black eye and other bruises. Then she called the police on me and I got arrested and put behind bars. I kept telling them that I never even touched her and that my wife was making things up. The cops laughed and told me to tell it to the judge. I spent the weekend in jail because I couldn't get bail until Monday morning. When I got a lawyer, the lawyer told me that if she was lying, I needed it all on tape. She told me to see her and get her to say damaging things about herself. I felt defeated and with nowhere to turn, I told my mom and dad what happened. They told me to give her the money to allow the problem to go away, but I wouldn't think of letting her get away with this kind of fraud. When she finally came home after a mini-vacation, I wanted to get her to confess. Carmel, 
We need to talk. I found something that doesn't add up. You've mentioned that I hurt you, but I have proof that contradicts that. I don't know what you're talking about, Adam. I found surveillance footage from our home security system. It shows the night you claimed I beat you. You were alone in the living room and there was no sign of any violence. I felt trapped, Adam. I thought if people believed I was a victim, I could escape from this relationship. I just felt like you couldn't provide the lifestyle I wanted, Adam. I thought this was the only way to get what I needed. So, it's about money? Carmel, we should have talked about this. Money isn't everything, and we could have found a solution together. I never beat you, right? Of course you didn't. You don't have enough strength to hurt a fly. I didn't think you'd understand. I wanted a life with more things, Adam, like a swimming pool and designer clothing. Carmel refused to drop the charges. She said if I didn't pay her tons of money, then she'd get her boyfriend in Florida to give me a beating. I told her I would think about it, but she didn't know it. But I had a cop listening in to the whole conversation. I even had it on tape on my iPhone. When the police heard her confession, they immediately went to arrest her at my house. As soon as they tried to put the cuffs on her, she ran out of the house and drove off in her car. She was driving so fast that she almost hit a pedestrian and clipped a few cars. Her car landed upside down on the road, and when rescuers got her out, she was screaming at them and demanding to sue the cops for chasing her. During the arrest, she kicked officers who had to use the taser on her. The cops charged her with a bunch of things, including marriage by fraud. As she sat in jail awaiting her sentencing, even her two kids didn't come to visit her. Instead, they both came out to defend me. Carmel called me to get me to help her out of her problem, but I refused, saying she brought it on herself. Adam, honey, I need you to drop the charges. I didn't mean to hurt you. No way. You caused me tons of problems. You accused me of beating you up. I could have lost my job. Please, just drop the charges and I will go leave you alone and live with my fiancé in Florida. Do you think I am weak and a fool? Keep dreaming, baby! Then the judge threw the book at her. Judge Smith charged her with multiple counts of online fraud and marriage by deception. He also ordered her deported after she finished serving her 12-year sentence. Her children didn't want to be associated with her anymore and never visited her in jail. Because Frank and Beth supported me during the trial, I legally adopted them. My kids truly understand what I went through with their mother. By the way, Samantha, who is the lawyer who represented me, fell for me hard. I love her too, and things are looking up for me. Samantha is also divorced and has two kids of her own. I look forward to having a blended family together. My story proves that karma hits hard on people who are lying, cruel, and ungrateful. Learn from my ex-wife. I had only just sat back down for one minute when she burst back into the room and marched to the front, knocking over a photo of my grandmother and not even pausing when it smashed on the ground. Everyone stared, open-mouthed at my boss, and I felt as though I were going to be sick. What are you doing? You won't come to work because of the funeral, so I'll make sure there is no funeral until you leave. My name is Joseph, and two weeks ago, my grandmother passed away. She was a huge influence in my life, and I was grieving heavily. I told my boss right away that I would need time for the funeral. Please, ma'am, my grandmother has just died. I will need some time off for the funeral. Is that okay? I'm giving you more notice than the policy says. My boss seemed okay at the time. Of course, Joseph. I'm so sorry to hear about your grandma. You're our best employee. Take the day off and here. Have a gift card for our store as a token of my condolences. This is a hard time. If you need anything, just call. My entire workforce had a tumultuous relationship with our boss. She was notorious for her mood swings. So hearing her give an immediate affirmative was such a relief. I spent the next two weeks working harder than ever just to prove that I wasn't going to let them down after I was shown such kindness. The night before the funeral, I hung up my apron, nodded to my co-workers, and left. My boss didn't acknowledge me, and I didn't think anything of it. The next day, I got dressed in black and met my family at my grandmother's house. It was almost like she had never left. I could still smell her perfume, 
and her favorite hard candy was piled high in the bowl in the center of the coffee table. Her cat, a gray British short hair, mewled from her perch on top of the cabinet. I'm so glad we're all here together today. Yeah, it's such a shame that it takes something like this to bring us all together. Let's organize a night a month at the very least, where we all make an effort to meet up. How about that? That sounds lovely. In my pocket, I could feel my phone vibrating. I quickly silenced it and didn't think anything of it. Everyone who knew me knew I was at a funeral today, so it must have been a spam call. The cars rolled up outside the house, and just as I was climbing into the car, my phone started to ring again. I silenced it once again, but I was starting to get a bad feeling. Who could be ringing me so insistently? By the fourth time, my phone was ringing. My sister and my aunt were looking at my pocket nervously. When we got out of the car at the church, my sister pulled me aside. You should just turn your phone off. Yeah, you're right. I'll do that now. Just as I took my phone out to turn it off, I got another call. It was my boss. Hello? Joseph, what the hell? Where are you? I suddenly felt cold all over. What was my boss doing? She knew I was at a funeral. I'm at my grandma's funeral. I told you this. Did you ask for time off? Yes. You said you understood. I said no such thing. You need to get to work right now. You told me two weeks ago that I could have the day off. I gave you plenty of notice. Do you have my agreement in writing? My family were giving me weird looks, and everyone who had been standing around on the lawn were moving towards the church doors. No, I don't. Listen, I'm sorry, but I have to go into the funeral now. I hung up on her shouting and turned my phone off. I instantly knew that I was going to be in trouble at work the next day, assuming I still had a job. The idea of losing my job over this made me begin to panic. Joseph, darling, the service is about to start. Come on. I didn't have a choice to sit it out, nor did I want to. But most importantly, I had to set boundaries. I knew I had asked. I knew she had said yes. And so I knew that by leaving my grandmother's funeral to attend work would be letting her win. And this was not something she should have been fighting me on. So I went inside, sat down next to my mother and sister, and I mourned my grandmother's death and celebrated her life. Mary MacDonald was a gracious woman. She was an active member of her church and community, and a doting parent to her three children. As a grandmother, she was unrivaled in her grandchildren's eyes. Mary left her mark on the world. Today, though we are saying goodbye to someone we dearly loved, to Mary MacDonald, we share this song. The priest lifted his hymn book, and we all copied. Just as the pianist struck the first key, the doors at the back opened with an explosive slam, and everyone shifted in their seats, exclaiming in surprise over the intrusion. I turned around too, and gasped. It was my boss. She had on her work uniform, setting her quite apart from everyone else in the room who were wearing black. Her beady black eyes scanned the room, searching for me. I slid down in my seat, face burning red. What was she doing here? Where is Joseph McDonald? What are you doing here? Do you have any idea how rude you're being? I'll have you know that I am a manager. I have a responsibility to my business, not to some pithy family get-together. This is a funeral. Please have some respect. I'm not leaving until I speak with Joseph McDonald. Joseph, you don't have to go. We can just call the police. The funeral was already a spectacle. I can't imagine how letting it get worse would do anyone any favors. I sighed, shook my head, and then stood up. All of my relatives and family friends were glaring at my boss, and even though there was a heavy weight of guilt in my stomach, I felt better knowing that they weren't blaming me for her hateful behavior. This intrusion is highly unusual, as most people have the common decency to not break into a funeral for a chit-chat. But how about we continue on with things? I left the funeral hall to the sound of the piano striking up a slow, mournful tune, and voices suddenly joining in. The doors closed behind us, blocking out the sound of the singing, and then we were alone in the red-carpeted hallway. I couldn't hold back my shock and anger anymore. Do you have any idea how many lines you're crossing by being here? This is my grandmother's funeral. We both know I asked for permission. We both know you said yes. So, you can either leave or I'll call the police and have them escort you off the property. She gaped at me, and I waited for her to say something, but she didn't, so I left her alone and headed back inside. 
I had only just sat back down for one minute when she burst back into the room and marched to the front, knocking over a photo of my grandmother and not even pausing when it smashed on the ground. Everyone stared, open-mouthed at my boss, and I felt as though I were going to be sick. What are you doing? You won't come to work because of the funeral, so I'll make sure there is no funeral until you leave. I was about to stand up. I didn't want my grandmother's funeral to be ruined because of me, but then my aunt grabbed my wrist and fixed me to the seat. You will do no such thing. You've been warned already, so I'm calling the police. See if I care. I'm the boss of a store and I need my workers. They have jobs. They'll understand. And if I say that Joseph needs to be at work, then he does. That's my right. I was astounded. I understood that they took their jobs seriously. But to think that she had the right to call me out of a funeral? To believe that the police would support her choice because of her position as a boss in a cafe? You're delusional. You're delusional if you think you're going to keep your job after today. You're going to have to beg on bended knee for it back, and you'll be lucky if you get anything close to your current wage. And I know all the business owners in the area, so I know you won't be able to get another job. You need me. Just leave before this gets worse. If she refuses to leave, we will continue to have the funeral around her. It's a bit unusual, but your grandmother insisted on having her will read immediately. The priest pulled out a big A4 envelope and had a solicitor join him on stage. Together, they started to read through the will. And to my oldest and hardest working grandchild, I grant my familial home and all of my stocks that I was given when I was 15 for a small mechanics business. I believe it has some worth now. The solicitor handed me the deed to the house and the details of the stocks. I choked. The stocks were for one of the biggest companies in the world. They were worth millions. However, included among them were stocks in the very company that I worked for. Not only that, but they would give me a controlling share of the company. Suddenly, I went from a low-level employee to essentially the owner of the company. Congratulations, boss, you've hijacked your last funeral. No more power trips for you. I couldn't believe just how quickly this had turned around, and I made sure to show her why I was so happy. The look on her face when she realized what I was showing her was priceless. One minute she was threatening my livelihood, and the next, I was in control of her employment. Suddenly, the police burst through the doors, and they ran up to my ex-boss. She tried to evade their attempts to catch her, but my family helped the police and they were able to catch and arrest her on the spot. They stopped to talk with the priest, but with a nod and a jerk of her arms, they escorted my boss out of the funeral hall to the cheer of everyone in attendance. I think that'll be the last I see of her for a while. Everyone laughed, but soon the funeral went on, and we told many stories of her life. Eventually, the funeral came to an end, and we all went to the wake and partied in my grandmother's name. A week later, I went to the prison to visit my ex-boss, who was still in jail. No one had posted her bail, and she was being held on charges of being a nuisance to the public and evading arrest. She had no friends because of her personality, and so she was alone. What are you doing here? I came to offer you the chance to apologize. You do understand how absolutely insane what you did was, right? Surely you're joking. You're to blame for what happened, not me. That's a shame. Especially since with my inheritance, I can choose whether or not you will still have a job or not, and honestly, considering how you behave both at work and in this situation, honestly, I wouldn't let you keep your job even if you weren't going to prison. And for a long time too by the sounds of it. Prison? For what? Trespassing, causing a disturbance, and after looking over the finances at work. There are some discrepancies in the accounts that you control. So much so, that I had to report them to the police. All you had to do was apologize, and I would have forgiven you, and instead of just being fired, you would have avoided going to prison. But not you are both going to prison and being fired. Maybe your time in prison will help you to see the error of your ways, but I won't hold my breath. I was ready to feel bad for you, but you're just a spiteful old witch who doesn't care about people's feelings. Your concern is solely whether people find you important or not. But now you don't have to worry. No one will ever think you're important again. And then I left and went to my job as the owner of the cafe. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson, after a thorough examination, it is my professional opinion that Benjamin is on the autism spectrum. 
I felt a mix of emotions upon hearing that. Excitement that we finally knew what was going on with our son, confusion on what caring for Ben would look like, and fear about the challenges he would go through growing up. So what does that mean for Benjamin? Simply put, he may face challenges in developing communication and social skills. It was at that point that Oliver got up and walked out of the office. My name is Emily. I'm married to my husband, Oliver, and the mother to our first child, Benjamin. Things were perfect between me and Oliver before our son was born. Our marriage was bliss. My pregnancy was easy too. And with Oliver there to help take care of me, we had nothing to worry about. A few weeks later when my due date arrived, I gave birth to a healthy baby boy, and Oliver and I were overjoyed. Our families were thrilled too, and they immediately took to Benjamin, spoiling him rotten, even if he was just a baby. And as he grew up, he appeared to be like a normal child. He learned to walk on time, and he seemed as happy as we were. Then things started to change. While Benjamin was still a toddler, I started to notice that he was different from the other kids. They were all talkative and making friends with the other children, but Benjamin didn't. He wouldn't make eye contact with anyone, and his communication skills took a lot longer to develop than it did for his peers. I decided to bring it up to Oliver one night after Benjamin had gone to bed. Oliver? Yes, dear? Have you noticed how Benjamin is different from the other kids his age? Different? How so? Benjamin won't make eye contact with people, and he's taking a lot longer to develop communication skills. Don't you think that's odd? No. Some kids are just slow to talk. He'll be fine. Still, I want to visit a doctor and see if there's anything wrong with him. Honey, we don't have to do that. Please. I would feel better if we knew what's going on with Ben. All right. A couple of days later, we had an appointment with a specialist. While the doctor examined Benjamin, Oliver and I had to stay in the waiting room, and as time went on, we got more and more nervous. It's been hours. The doctor said it shouldn't take this long. We shouldn't have come down here at all. There's nothing wrong with our son. I don't know why I let you talk me into this. Shortly after that, the doctor invited us into his office. He had us sit down before breaking the news to us. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson, after a thorough examination, it is my professional opinion that Benjamin is on the autism spectrum. I felt a mix of emotions upon hearing that. Excitement that we finally knew what was going on with our son, confusion on what caring for Ben would look like, and fear about the challenges he would go through growing up. So what does that mean for Benjamin? Simply put, he may face challenges in developing communication and social skills. It was at that point that Oliver got up and walked out of the office. I asked him to stay, but nothing I said made him turn around. I didn't know what else to do, so I went back into the doctor's office with Benjamin. When I sat down, the doctor started giving me resources for parents of autistic children and what I can expect when raising Ben. After we'd gotten home, I noticed that Oliver was nowhere to be found. I texted him, asking where he was, and his response surprised me. I can't do this, Emily. I didn't sign up for a life like this. I want to leave and start fresh. We can have another child, a normal one. Oliver, how can you say something like that? Benjamin is our son. I won't abandon him. He needs us now more than ever. We made vows to each other and we made vows to him. I won't break my promises. I can't do this, Emily. I never signed up to handle a burden like this. Oliver, please don't say that. I won't be tied down by our freak of a son. I can't. Oliver never came back to the house that night and I ended up taking Benjamin to my parents' house. Through my tears, I explained to my parents what happened at the doctor's office and what Oliver said. It was then that I realized I couldn't stay married to someone who could so easily abandon their own child and act like they don't matter. My parents understood and they told me I could stay with them for as long as I needed to. It wasn't easy, but after a few days, I reached out to Oliver. Oliver, we need to talk. All right. I want a divorce. After what you said about our son, I can't stay married to you. I'm going to take my money out of our account and find a home for me and Benjamin, and I will raise him on my own. Is there any way I can convince you to abandon Benjamin and restart our lives with a normal child? When I read his message, I couldn't help how angry I got. How could the man I married become such a heartless monster? This is our son he's talking about. No, 
You will never convince me to leave my child behind just because he's different. I can't believe I ever married a man like you. I'll be sending you the divorce papers this week. I kept my word and met with Oliver later in the week to go through with the divorce. He tried again to get me to change my mind about Benjamin, but when he saw that I was serious, he gave up and signed the divorce papers. I felt relieved that I would no longer be married to someone who wouldn't love my child, but at the same time, it was also sad to lose someone that I once loved and started a new life with. After the divorce, I moved me and Benjamin to an apartment near my parents' house. It was a lot smaller than I was used to, and it was a struggle having to adjust, but my parents came by every day to help and provide support. It's been years at this point, and Benjamin is close to graduating high school. As he grew up, he developed some social skills, but most importantly, he discovered his passion for playing the piano. He's able to use music as a way to express what he's feeling and connect with others in a way that he can't when using words. He's performed at school and in auditoriums in front of large audiences, and he's gotten very popular over the past few years in our town. His interest in music started back in elementary school when the teacher put on classical music while the students were working and Benjamin lit up when he heard the piano. He kept trying to mimic how it was played and the teacher suggested to me that I start him with piano lessons. I did so, and it was like he transformed into a different child. Benjamin played for his school's musicals and shows, and he's even enrolled in talent competitions, earning him prize money. I keep the money stored away for him in case of a rainy day or he needs to tune up his piano. In high school, he started playing in the town hall during special events the people put on, and everyone loves to hear him play. Oh, he sounds like an angel playing like that. I know. I couldn't be happier with putting him through all his piano lessons. Are you his mother? I am. You should be so proud of your son's talent. Thank you, and I am. I couldn't be any prouder of him. All of a sudden, after one of Benjamin's performances, I got a message from Oliver. I was rather surprised. We hadn't spoken since the day we got divorced. Hi, how are you and Benjamin doing? What is this about, Oliver? I just want to know how my son is doing. From what I hear, he's quite the piano player. He is. And I also hear that he's won some prize money, too. Maybe he'd be willing to share it with his father? Is that what this is all about? Money? That is so selfish of you. It's not selfish. It's selfish of you to keep the money all to yourself. Benjamin's talent has brought him success, and I'm his father. I have a right to some of the share of that success. We don't owe you anything, Oliver. You walked away when things got tough. You left when we needed you the most. Since then, I've built a good life for me and Benjamin, and I won't let you jeopardize that. His success is his own, and you have no claim to it. What do you even need the money for, anyway? I've made some mistakes and I need money to get back on my feet. That isn't our problem. I couldn't believe Oliver's nerve. He never wanted to be a part of Benjamin's life, and then he wanted to reap the rewards of it. I was so angry, I blocked Oliver then and there. That didn't stop him from showing up to Benjamin's next performance, though. Sir, you can't enter without a ticket. Please, I just want to see my son. He's the one performing. I had been waiting by the door so I could hear something going on in the lobby. I left the theater, and I became angry when I saw Oliver there. You have no right to be here. Emily, please. You chose to walk away from your son, Oliver. You don't get to show up now because you think you can benefit from Benjamin's success. I just need some help, Emily. You should have thought about that before you walked away. Oliver tried to rush past the security guard into the theater, but the guard stopped him. The manager of the theater called the police on him when he wouldn't calm down. And once I showed them the messages of him begging for Benjamin's money, they charged him with stalking and harassment. It wasn't easy having to become a single mother and provide everything and more for my child, but being able to see him blossom into a talented young man while his father sits in a jail cell, in debt and unwanted, has made it all worth it.